appreciate everyone joining us today and uh, listening to the uh, the short talk that I have here. So um, uh, just a brief introduction. I've been at Highlands, uh, New Mexico Highlands, uh, since 2005. I started in the Department of Natural Resource Management. In 2016, I became the interim VP for Enrollment Management. I was away uh, last year on a professional development uh, with the American Council on Education. And then uh, now in July of 20, I started as the uh, special assistant uh, uh, to the president here at Highlands. So, uh, so my talk today, just uh, let's see, how do I change slides here? There we go. All right, so uh, a brief outline of what I'm gonna be talking about today. So uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the, the demographic shift uh, that has happened across the nation in terms of uh, race and ethnicity of our students. And uh, I, I just want to remind everyone that uh, throughout the talk, I will be using the word Hispanic, uh, Latino, uh, uh, Latinx, uh, Latina, and so on, all interchangeably. And uh, the reason I'm doing that is because the references that I used, uh, the sources that I used at different times of, of, uh, of, of their publication, uh, they were using the terms that they were using. So I'm just using those interchangeably and just wanted to make sure that uh, everyone knew that. Um, I'll also be talking about uh, what is, a, what is a, an MSI and what is an HSI. So in other words, what is a minority serving institution and what is a Hispanic serving institution? Um, why did uh, HSIs come about? Uh, and then going to be moving on to the importance of HSIs and, uh, and in that, their importance in Hispanic, Hispanics uh, and uh, education attainment, uh, Title V funding that is associated with MSIs and HSIs, and uh, a little bit about uh, Highlands University and the funding that it, it has received through these grant programs, okay? So uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, de the, the demographic shift, so uh, some statistics here on uh, Hispanics. So between 2000 and 2010, uh, a total number of uh, Hispanic undergraduates increased 67% nationally. So we've got quite, a, quite an increase in Hispanic students in the last 10 years, uh, excuse me, in, in the last 20 years. Uh, the college going rate of Hispanic students increased from 22 to 37 percent from 2000 to 2015. And in 2017, uh, it was noted that 60 per, 67 percent of Hispanic high school graduates um, ages 16 to 24 were enrolled in college compared to 69 percent of their white counterparts. And so we can see that, that uh, as the Hispanic population is increasing, more and more of them are also going to college and HSIs play a big role in this. Um, the percentage, this percentage increase uh, actually equal to about 3.5 million individuals in 2017. So that uh, increase was uh, quite dramatic. And then uh, because of this, or in part because of this, an increase in college age prospective, prospective Latinx students is projected to continue into 2050. So uh, more and more uh, students into the future are going to be uh, Hispanic students. So, um, and, and so I want you to keep some of those uh, statistics in mind uh, as I will come back to them a little bit later on. So what are MSIs and HSIs? So in 1965, uh, the, the federal government established the Higher Edu Education Act, uh, which recognized minority serving institutions and minority serving institutions originally included the uh, HBCUs and the tribal colleges and universities. At a later date, it then began to recognize what we call the Hispanic serving institutions or uh, the uh, non-tribal uh, Native American serving institutions is another example. A um, couple of differences that I wanted you to, to, to take note of is 
that the creation of the MSIs, uh, H, uh, HBCUs and tribal colleges and universities were mission specific. So in other words, when those institutions were created, they were created with a mission to specifically serve black students, the HBCUs, and to specifically serve uh, American Indian students, which were the tribal colleges and universities. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to, you to keep in mind here is that with this designation and the creation of these institutions, uh, they were also provided some funding that was non-competitive, all right? Later on, HSIs uh, were then created and, um, and these were institutions that enrolled a minimum of 25% of full-time undergraduate students that were uh, Hispanic or Latinx students. And 50% of that population uh, needs to demonstrate a financial need. And so in order, uh, in other words, in order to qualify as a Hispanic serving institution, the institution needs to have a full-time undergraduate student population of 25%. And of those 25%, 50% of them should be uh, in financial need. And so um, some of this, uh, uh, these H HSIs evolved due to the increase of population in institutions. Um, the, uh, 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 let me step back here a bit. What I wanted to clarify here is when the HSIs were created and this designation was, uh, was then established, it it, it was established in institutions that already had missions. And therefore, those institutions that became HSIs, unlike the HBCUs and the TCUs, did not necessarily have a mission to serve those students. And so that's a, a, a difference there. And then the HSI designation also made institutions eligible to apply for funding. But the, the distinction here again is that HSIs had to compete for the funding, unlike the HBCUs and TCUs, which had some funding that were designated non-competitively to them. And so some, some uh, uh, distinctions that I wanted to make sure that uh, I, I provided uh, some clarity to. So then uh, why did HSIs emerge? or why did uh, HSIs become HSIs? So uh, in, uh, in the 1980s, uh, the founding of, the, of HAKU um, became very evident. And uh, the, one of the missions of HAKU was to bring higher ed institutions that serve high populations of Hispanic students together to advocate the federal from the federal government funding for their institutions. And then uh, the, the national, adv uh, they, they advocated nationally and, and, and the reason they were advocating for this was because they saw that there was a need to serve this population that was unlike the traditional college going population of the time. And so there was a need to serve them in a different way and so resources were needed in order to do that. And Haku played a big role in uh, petitioning to the federal government to not only for the designation, but also to um, provide funding for these institutions. Uh, of course, the civil rights movement of the 1960s played a big role in why Hispanic serving institutions uh, um, emerged. Uh, the development of uh, federal financial aid uh, the, the Hispanic uh, population in general has been described as a low income um, population. And so when federal financial aid became available, then uh, it became more of a reality for this population to uh, attend college. Um, of course, immigration of uh, Hispanic uh, people or populations to the United States um, played a huge role. And then the migration of Hispanics within the United States played a big role 
in the development and creation, uh, or the, not necessarily the creation, the development of uh, Hispanic serving institutions across the United States. Um, Hispanic population migration within the United States, not only, we didn't only see increases in established Hispanic communities, but we saw Hispanic populations move into communities where um, Hispanic populations really didn't exist. So this is a, um, a few graphics that show uh, how HSIs have increased through the years. So in 1994, we had 189 institutions designated, but by 2017, we have 523 HSI uh, uh, institutions designated. And then we can also see on the map here of the United States where these institutions exist. And so uh, again, um, historically, California, New Mexico, Texas have been states that have high numbers of uh, Hispanic uh, populations and also the high number of Hispanic serving institutions. But we can see that Hispanic, Hispanics have migrated to uh, all parts of the United States. And then we also have Hispanic serving institutions uh, in states that uh, maybe we wouldn't think uh, there would be any. Uh, for example, Kansas has four Hispanic serving institutions um, as of uh, the time that this data had come out. So this is just an example of how the number of institutions has increased through the years and how the Hispanic population has expanded and grown through the years throughout the United States. So what is the importance of HSIs? Um, I, I wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about um, some of the misconceptions that are out there or misperceptions that are out there about HSIs. In many cases, institutions that are, uh, HSI institutions are viewed as being less than. Uh, in many cases, institutions that are HSIs have um, um, employees, uh, faculty, staff, that don't want to make it public that they're HSIs because then there's a belief that they're less, less than in some way or another. Um, it also, there's also the misconception that the funding that HSIs are getting, the federal funding that HSIs are competitively getting is only used for Hispanic students. That's not true either. Uh, and so there's others that uh, um, I, I won't mention, but in all reality, HSIs are very, very important for the Hispanic population and other minoritized populations because uh, HSIs don't only serve Hispanic students, but they also serve uh, um, Native American students, uh, African American black students and Pacific Islanders and other uh, minority populations. So, uh, just some, some more data here. In 2017, 66% of the Hispanic undergraduates attended an HSI. Uh, and this is in compared to all, uh, all uh, students uh, attending uh, university across the United States. When we look at full-time students only, uh, full-time students at public four-year HSIs complete in six years at a 74.1% rate versus the national rate of 42.7%. Uh, so we can see that Hispanic students are much more uh, successful at, at an HSI. The full-time students at private four-year institutions complete at a 77.9% rate in six years compared to the federal rate of 49.1%. Uh, Full-time students in two-year uh, community college uh, students um, had a four-year graduation rate of 40% versus 25% for the federal rate. And so we see that students are more successful at these HSI institutions, whether it's a four-year or a two-year institutions. HSIs also serve a large concentration of ethnic minorities, like I mentioned earlier, or other uh, ethnic groups graduating a large percentage of the uh, Latinx students who are enrolled in higher ed. 
I have quite a few slides, so I'm going quickly. Um, so uh, more important on uh, on HSIs. So the the number of degrees awarded to Hispanic students account for 37% of the degrees awarded to, to them are at HSIs. Um, HSIs also serves uh, students by uh, pro promoting uh, racial diversity. Um, in this time, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, diversity at our institutions and those HSI institutions tend to be more diverse than uh, other institutions. Um, like I said earlier, they place a special emphasis on educating our Hispanic students. Uh, Hispanic serving institutions also uh, serve a high percentage of low-income students. Tuition is typically, typically lower at HSIs than it is at other institutions. And like I said, the funding is specifically to uh, assist um, minoritized populations within those institutions. Um, just some data here, uh, just to show that even though HSIs are doing a good job at uh, education, educating uh, minority populations and specifically Hispanic students, there's still a, a gap. The, the attainment is still not equal between uh, white students and Hispanic students. We can see that uh, the um, white students are uh, graduating from high school at a higher degree, um, actually going to college uh, and completing at higher rates than uh, Hispanic students. Um, the high school graduation rate is about even, uh, but higher education is much higher for white students compared to Hispanic students. So moving on to, to Title V funding. So again, we, I, I, I presented some data on, on, on how the Hispanic serving institutions came about and the difference between a Hispanic serving institution, an HBCU, and a TCU. And uh, uh, the, like, as I mentioned, a HBCU and a TCU have mission-specific uh, for their institutions to serve those populations. Uh, HSIs don't necessarily uh, do. Uh, HBCUs, in addition to their mission, also get uh, dedicated funding to those institutions. HSIs actually have to, excuse me, my phone is ringing. Uh, HSIs have to actually compete for that funding. And so I wanna talk about that Title V funding for a little bit here. We can see that uh, the total Title V funding in millions has increased up to fiscal year 2010. But since then, Title V funding has actually decreased. But if we compare that to the um, number of HSIs, we see that the number of HSIs is actually increasing. So in other words, the funding pool is decreasing while the student pool is increasing at these institutions. And so there's a need to, uh, for the federal government to recognize this and designate um, more funding through these types of programs. There's other programs other than the, the Title V, but I was just using this as an example. Um, again, like I said earlier, uh, Latino enrollment in higher ed tripled uh, in from uh, 94 to 95 to 2013 to 2014. Uh, and this growth resulted in incre increased college enrollment, but it also increased in a much higher proportion of uh, Latinos going to college compared to the white counterparts. And that's that graph on the right. So, um, so what is the purpose and importance of Title V funding? So, the HSI program, uh, competitive grant program was created to expand educational opportunities for and improve the academic attainment of Hispanic students. So Title V funding is specifically for these two purposes here, to expand and enhance the academic offerings, program quality, institutional stability, 
uh, at uh, four uh, Hispanic college students and helping a large number of Hispanic students and other low-income individuals complete post-secondary degrees. And so, like I mentioned earlier, many uh, there's a belief out there that the Title V funding can only be used for Hispanic students. And uh, that's not true. The Title V funding can be used at an institution to um, enhance student support services, as an example. And then those student support services are available to all students. And so it's not designated necessarily only to Hispanic students at that institution. So um, before I move on here, um, the, 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 the Title V funding has been decreasing while the number of Hispanic students and Hispanic serving institutions has increasing, has been increasing. And so uh, the next graph, uh, actually the next slide that I have is um, how has HSI or minority serving institution funding impacted Highlands in the past 10 years? And so what I have here may be kind of difficult to see but what I really wanted to focus on is on the bottom line over here. So in the past 10 years, NMHU has been awarded competitive funding of up to $20 million that is coming from these types of programs. And, and so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that Highlands has benefited from this type of funding, Title V funding and other HSI and MSI funding to enhance what we're doing to serve our students. But as the number of HSIs increase, the competition for this funding that is decreasing at the federal level is going to increase, right? We're gonna have more competitors. And so, um, one of the things that we really need to think about is, are we truly using this funding that we're getting effectively to serve our students, to have the ability to develop the outcomes that make us competitive the next time around the funding source comes so that we can continue to receive this funding. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that in the literature, because the number of HSIs has increased so rapidly in the past 10 years, the literature is questioning whether the HSI institutions are truly serving those populations or are they wanting to become HSIs just to have the ability to compete for the funding that is available. And so there's some criticism of being an HSI because you have the numbers or being an HSI because you're truly serving those populations. And so just things for us to think about, and I think it's very important for us to think about them in, 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 how, uh, in how we move forward in not only competing for this funding, but when we get it, are we effectively using this funding in a way that uh, is truly serving our students as opposed to competing for it to get the funding. Um, so um, I, I, on the left uh, column here, uh, upward bound, some of the programs we've heard of that, uh, and actually some funding that has left us already, upward bound, uh, the, the TRIO program, the Student Support Services, the Gear Up program, uh, those three programs don't exist at Highlands anymore. And so that's funding that we're not getting anymore that is out there, but, because of that increased competition, it's making it more difficult for us to get that funding, right? Um, that US Department of Ed, that CCRAA HSI, that's the money that uh, created the ARMA Center. The beginning of, of that funding created the ARMA Center. And then uh, other funding that has been coming through the years uh, through, um, through these programs. And so I just wanted to give you the example that Highlands is benefiting from this funding, but what I'm asking us to do is to really 
question, are we effectively using this funding to truly serve and intentionally serve our students? And then if we are, can we produce that data that then truly makes us more competitive to get additional funding because that competition is increasing. So um, Garcia and Taylor uh, indicated, so as student demographics have changed, so too have students' needs. As such, the idea of serving students has evolved to include providing academic and social support and fostering a positive campus racial climate as HSIs look to the future beyond their commitment to enrolling and graduating a diverse student body, they are right to construct organizational identities that is exemplify what it means to be Latinx serving. And so what Garcia and Taylor are saying here is, let's not only look at our institutions in terms of enrollment and meeting that 25% threshold, let's begin to look at our institutions in how we create a culture to support our students, a culture that truly supports them and a, a friendly campus that truly supports them, that includes them. And how do we begin to then incorporate those pieces into the organizational structure of our institution so that we're not having one-offs like Dia de los Muertos. We have one day that we celebrate Dia de los Muertos and the day comes and goes and it's gone. And then we forget about the Hispanic culture until the following year when Dia de los Muertos comes around again, right? What they're truly saying is institutions should look within their organizational structure and their identities and how can they change those to truly serve the Latino population into the future? And so with that, I'd, I'd like to open it for questions. And I hope you have questions. I'm sure I forgot to say something. I have a question, Dr. Martinez. Uh, Kelly, go ahead. Well, so I'm just curious, <clears throat> because there's this increased competition for these kinds of grants, where do you feel is the focus of these, of these granting institutions? Are they looking for you know, towards academic support, towards this more holistic cultural support or experiential type of opportunities for students or kind of a com combination of these things? It's, it's a combination. A lot, of the, a lot of the data is showing that it's a combination of these things, right? Um, the, the, the physical campus, what does the physical campus look like and how does it represent the diverse population that uh, attends that campus, right? And then the activities, the cultural activities, whether it's Dia de los Muertos or some other activity that uh, our African-American students can identify with or our international students can identify with. And so it's not only looking and focusing on one specific race or ethnicity. The idea is how can we create a campus climate that is inclusive of all of these populations and not having to do it in such a way that it feels tokenized, but doing it in such a way that it just, it just is, right? And so the funding that is out there, it is in our best interest to use it to cover all these areas, right? Whether it's diversifying our faculty and, uh, creating a physical uh, structure that is inviting to everyone and having cultural activities that is also inclusive of everyone and then integrating uh, uh, these uh, curricula that is needed in order to reach these various populations. And so it's really everything. Uh, Bill. Uh, Dr. Uh, real quick. Uh, Dr. Martinez. Uh, I have a question uh, about how do we, does the federal government require uh, performance indicators, uh, key attainment uh, statistics to evaluate who, which institutions are 
are doing a better job than others uh, or is it strictly how are they grading these how do they make their decisions well the the, the in, initially it's based like i said it's based on population and 50 percent low-income students to be eligible to get the funding once you get the funding then you have your reporting requirements to that agency that you got the funding from. And, and you do have to, and again, you do have to make a case in order to be competitive, you do have to make a case of how you're gonna measure what you're doing, right? Uh, and I think Armas is, the, is, is, is a really good example. How well do we measure what we're doing at Armas to show that what we're doing there is actually working, right? And, so I and, see that STEM is a big emphasis uh, the last four years, STEM education, uh, which is, I think, science, technology, engineering, and uh, math, right? Yes, that's right. And so, so to, to answer your question, Bill, is that the, there, no one is really grading us. The agency that provides us the funding grades us, but it grades us for the period of time that they provided the funding, right? So when the funding leaves the university, then nobody's looking at us, we're only looking at ourselves. And that's what I'm emphasizing is we really need to look at ourselves in how we're performing and make it a goal for ourselves rather than just for the funding agency. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a question, Dr. Martinez. Dr. Moore. Um, we're probably preaching to the choir at this point. It, most people who are interested in this kind of information are here, or they want to learn more about what we're doing collectively. And everyone probably already knows by now that Dr. Martinez and I both are on the President's Council for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And Dr. Martinez is really in a pivotal role because he's now the special assistant to the President and working on some initiatives that will help assess where we're at as an institution. And it's been pretty obvious through the council that um, we really do need to take a hard look at our own in infrastructure with the, uh, the policies, the practices, um, all of the documents we have and really look at where we stand. And nationally, you know, this is the perfect opportunity. As they say, it's the perfect storm that has been happening the last couple of months. So that more and more people are really looking internally to see where they are at when it comes to equity and inclusion. And the broader umbrella really is equity, equity for all students, equity in the delivery of services, equity in representation of who faculty and students are on our HSI campus. So as Dr. Martinez was talking, it brought to mind that we're, we've made, um, like we've attempted baby steps and we have this larger vision of what has to happen as an HSI in order to even bring in more money. And Dr. Martinez raised an excellent question about the critique uh, directed at not only HSIs, but now this Native American uh, non-tribal serving institutions. Are we really getting into the business because there are funds attached? Or are we really serious about getting into the business because we have students who have such high needs and we're not just talking about their financial needs. They're, as a social worker, we know that many of our students come from situations that, you know, are, they're heartbreaking. So they're coming to this institution, they're needing all of these extra support services, they need the financial aid, but we seriously have to ask ourselves, are we equipped to be able to address the needs of um, not only Hispanic students, but now indigenous students? So. I fully support what Dr. Martinez is, is representing today, knowing that we have to seriously look at our own campus climate 
And do our students want to stay here once they get here? And I'm not just talking about Hispanics because Title V money impacts all of our students. I'm talking about black students, Indian students, Asian, international students even. So one good thing, and I'm just gonna throw it out there, we're promoting um, the development and the administration of a campus climate survey to really look at what the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues are on our campus. And they're real. So we're looking at systemic issues that have created this environment that we're trying to change. And we want, a, a, I think, a stronger um, sociopolitical culture on this campus that will truly support all of our students who are in need. You, Dr. Moore, do you think there's a bad environment? A bad environment, bad. Yeah, um, you said you're, you're, you're talking about the need to change the environment and mm -hmm. uh, an environment that, that existed when I went to school was welcoming, supportive, uh, and, and collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm trying to understand, do you think, where do I put this? Well, I, I, I'll, how I'll big a need is there to change? What's the, what kind of, what, how big a need is there to change? What, I, Bill, what, I'll, I'll, what I'll try wrong? to answer that. I, I, I don't necessarily would say that it's a bad environment. I think that we need to, we need to look at our data and, and, and based on our data, what is our retention rate and graduation rate of our uh, African American students, our Native American students? our Asian students, our um, Hispanic students, and, and even our white students. And how does that compare to each other? And how does that compare to uh, the national average? And, and it, truly at Highlands, we have a higher Hispanic gradu uh, retention rate than we have of any of our other populations. But our African-American retention rate is fairly low. Our uh, Native American Mm -hmm. uh, retention rate is fairly low. Our graduation rates are low. And so these are quantitative indicators of how well of a, uh, how well as an institution we are doing with those students. But other indicators, like I mentioned earlier, is the diversity of the workforce at the institution. How well does the faculty and the staff and the administration represent the uh, diverse population that it serves, right? That's another indicator. Another indicator is uh, our, our curriculum. How well does, uh, do, do we integrate uh, cultural sensitivity and all these things into our curriculum, right? The other thing is the overall culture of our institution. How well do we integrate these various cultures that are at our institution as in the form of students, do how well do we integrate into the overall culture of our institution, right? And so if, if we look at these separately, then we're doing better in some than we are in other. And, and so to truly serve this population, we need to look at all those aspects and work towards them, work towards some ideal towards them and, and and keep working at it. I don't know that we will ever get there. And just to uh, add to what Dr. Dr. Kravitz, you're on mute. Thank you. I was trying to be quiet. Uh, thank you so much for doing this important work. Um, it's good to see seven years after I left, it's almost eight that you know you're still continuing this this path because it's so important to highlands um i guess i want to kind of integrate some of what people have said and, and ask you another question that sort of goes along the same route i think that there's a certain amount of when you seek funds of, of meeting the requirements so to speak um and we know that the direction as, as bill has pointed out the direction has largely been in, in stem on the other hand highlands depends largely on its professional schools, education, social work, and business. And those are not the area. So sometimes in STEM, you end up bringing in outside people who may or may not be 
Latinx. I'm from California. That's all we use nowadays. <laughs> um, and then your Latinx students who are native to the area may still be struggling along in those other areas, such as social work and, and education. So how do you bridge that gap of what they want and what the college needs and what the students need? Because it's all of it. Well, well and, and I agree with you, Dr. Cavez, that it's all of it. And, and, and that's why I emphasize is that we need to set standards or goals for ourselves. And then if there is funding out there, how can we use that funding to supplement or and or support some of what we decided that we need to do for ourselves? Thank you. So uh, other questions? Um, I, I have another question, Edward. Um, yes, sir. So we all know the uh, Yazi uh, Martinez uh, decision that that in the courts that is driving uh, the uh, the uh, K through twelve educational paradigm now, and there there's been a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth and so forth. So it seems to me a great benefit could come to our state. If we, if we had active research going on relative to uh, what does addressing the Yazzie Martinez case effectively mean? I, I know legislators and I know public policymakers are struggling. They say, well, we can, you know, we directed more money at a lot of these programs. But the court keeps coming back and saying, well, you're either not doing enough or it's not in the right areas. I think one of the things that uh, an opportunity we may have would be to do research in this area to add to the collective wisdom, insights and knowledge of our state. No one should do better at this than us, given the makeup of our state and the natural diversity that exists. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, if you'd like to respond to that, is, or do you know, well, is there any effort going on where that kind of research is being done? Um, I, I don't know uh, any re of research that is specifically looking into, into that, uh, but, but, but there is a huge amount of research going into how well institutions are serving the minority populations at their institutions. And, and, and that's where I came up with these various areas of what the literature is showing is that it's, it's not only providing a student support center where you can provide tutoring for the students, it's in addition to that, what does your physical campus look like? You know, the things that I've mentioned, the, the cultural activities that you include. So it's all of those things that really uh, show that institutions that are doing that are, are retaining their students and graduating them at higher rates than institutions that aren't doing that. And so- well, I think it's, a, it's an open challenge to all of us to think about uh, what are the three things that New Mexico could do in order to improve the outcomes desired and mandated by the, by the Yazi Chavez decision. Uh, you know, there, there's just a lot of uh, consternation in this area. And I think it's an open challenge to all of us who are in professional roles and in other roles throughout New Mexico, uh, not, just higher, not just higher ed and, and education, but from within the business community, these are things that I advocate for uh, as we all need to collectively think about it. Uh, because it's a problem that's not yet resolved. We do have the, the reality of, of our uh, Hispanic uh, students and our uh, native students are not as successful by any measurement that you want to look at in getting into the K through 12 system and beyond in mm -hmm. New Mexico. So and, and I think it's an, a huge challenge, challenge for all of us. I think another challenge that we have and this is just my, my observation and not whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I believe that we, because we're, we're an institution that is located in a predominantly Hispanic community. So we sometimes tend to believe that 
we're doing a good job in serving these students because that's the majority of our students. So therefore we're serving them, right? And so it's harder for us to look at ourselves and determine how well we're doing compared to an institution that is becoming an HSI because their population is increasing and then they're able to really think about how do they serve that population that is increasing at their institution. And so sometimes we fall back and say, well, we're, we are doing it, right? We are serving them. Look at all the ones that we're graduating, right? Look at all the ones that we're retaining. But the, the, the truth of the matter is it's, it's the majority of our population to begin with. And so, you know, how can we look inward and determine whether we're really doing that? Another thing, another thing that I'd like to mention is we, we, we really, I, I believe that we really truly need to embrace this status at our institution. If, if you type HSI in the search engine of our website, what comes up is some stories that have mentioned HSI, but our website itself doesn't even identify us as a Hispanic serving institution. And so are we truly embracing it? I think that's been a historical Which, issue. And right? that even when we go back to 2015 with the first efforts at establishing this diversity council, HSIs were like on the periphery. Nobody wanted to say that we are an HSI. And Dr. Martinez pointed this out, is that people think that if we say that, that we're diluting the quality of our programs in our university, which is not true. But getting the mass, we need a critical mass to recognize the value of being an HSI and what our true mission is in serving all people. And it's not just for Hispanics. I keep saying this, this is going to benefit all of our students. Yeah, and that's why I think we really need to home in on what are the key indicators that show the world that as an institution, we are excelling in doing that. And, and, and there need to be some indicators that we can compare to other Johnny come lately, I'm going to call them HSIs, right? Because they see that, well, that's a way to get additional funding. And I shouldn't question their motives. I, 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 let me back up. I would assume everybody's motives are, are pure. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think we need to think about how we can distinguish what we are doing. We've been at it at a, lo a lot longer than most institutions. And uh, we should have best practices in, inculcated into our culture right now. And uh, so I, I guess I, I would be one that would say, I really think we all need to think about how we can develop these key indicators because I think they're there. I mean, I know too many people who have been successful in a lot of different careers who uh, are products of this institution. And we just need to figure out how we can capitalize on all of that and uh, demonstrate and then market and celebrate those achievements. Other questions, comments? Um, and so I just wanted to make a, make a comment on, on the, the, evolving, uh, the evolving titles. And so uh, Hispanic is, uh, what the federal government uses to, to identify uh, this population. Uh, through the years, they've been Latinos, Latinas. Uh, the, the latest is uh, La, uh, Latinx, uh, and uh, that is gender neutral and is the, the use of uh, the uh, definition of uh, these populations that I've been talking about. And so there's no difference between uh, a Latinx serving institution and a Hispanic serving institution is one and the same. Uh, Dr. Salazar. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Martinez. Um, I will be brief and probably there's, there's a lot that could be shared, but I'll just simply uh, keep it to a minimum and probably simply use an example. Um, I listened very closely to the uh, presentation regarding uh, the strategic plan 
I certainly listen closely to you, Dr. Martinez, and to you, Regent Garcia, about that. And I see, for example, the questioning that Regent Garcia is asking basically takes us back to the strategic plan and why it is what it is. And I think the terms like diversity, uh, uh, diversity in, in, in the big sense was a matter that was talked about. Mm -hmm. And also based on questions that are being uh, raised again, and I'm sure he does it all the time in terms of his responsibilities as a region that Re Regent Garcia is talking about is accountability. You know, How do we measure accountability? Those things are significant and important. I said I would keep it brief and I will. Certainly in my particular case, um, I left the university in 2003. Many of you probably know the fact that I actually now served as a legislator. I will serve in that capacity through the end of this calendar year. And then I'm retiring. I decided not to run for reelection. But I, my perspective basically is the following. And I, I have like a lot, lot of examples the situation regarding the significance of MSI, HSI, Haku, and all of these are, are significant and important. I think Regent Garcia, forgive me, uh, Regent, for repeatedly using your name, but I think in part, the comments that he makes relative to the matter of, we should know how to do it better. We've been, been at it better. We don't have to argue there were newcomers. But I think in part, what that also does really is it, it actually creates an expectation for a university that maybe others, newcomers, may not. And I think it goes to some of the points that you've been raising, Dr. Martinez, relative to that issue. I think without, without question, the significance, for example, because I said I would be using examples, of the School of Education and the role that it plays relative to questions of culture and language, I think certainly at one time were very well known. And Highlands was thought to be the exemplar, not just in the state, but in the nation of a school of education that was doing it right relative to the issues of culture and language. And in particular, as it related to Hispanic, okay? I, and one can spend an entire day talking about that. I think, again, like I said before, the significance of your presentation, Dr. Martinez, was that in fact, you very correctly, I think, indicated what actually has happened, what the numbers are, where we're going, and the fact that we have additional challenges. And I think that's right. You know, I can, for example, mention a few people, people that many know well, in this particular case, attorney, and Michael Aragon, for example. I know Michael was in D.C. under Haku uh, internship more than once, twice, an experience, for example, that many, for example, have not had. My son, although he was going from a different university than Highlands, actually also spent two summers doing work under Haku in D.C. in terms of internship. I said I would be brief, and I will. I think, in part, the things that are important I do know, again, Regent uh, brought up the issue regarding Yazi Martinez. I think it does pose two things. It poses challenges, but it also poses an opportunity. The question about opportunity is the detail of how we get there is the important thing. And it's gonna take creativity and imagination and serious, serious work relative to what I would consider to be administration at a university to make sure that we move it in the right direction as it relates to that matter. I actually have carried considerable amount of legislation, most of it unsuccessful relative to pushing that issue. But anyway, enough said. I said actually what I would end with an example. The example that I wanna to go to is an example relative to something that happened very recently. But I think it points to the fact about the significance of the titles that you've been using, Dr. Martinez. I think in this particular case, I think you certainly, Dr. Martinez, are aware of this. Maybe some of the other people are not, but the New Mexico delegation announced a $4.1 million allocation to seven New Mexico universities to improve educational opportunities for Hispanic students. 
And the federal grant will fund outreach from Hispanic serving institutions, HSIs in other words, to improve learning outcome for students before, during and after enrollment, exactly the things we're talking about. And I think in part, Highlands is playing a role. And in this particular case, out of the 4.1 million that are being talked about, Highlands is receiving about $600,000. $600, and in order to be correct relative to what that grant is doing, Highlands intends to use the grant funding to increase student recruitment and retention by development, developing a pilot program in the university signature Facundo Valdez School of Social Work. The initiative will employ pedag pedagogical active learning strategies while implementing met mentoring and advising programs to help students remain enrolled and succeed in their classes. Highlands will also develop an aggressive community outreach program with social media content, content coupled with strategic relationships with regional community colleges and secondary schools with high enrollment of Hispanics and low income students that focus on career and research opportunities. Well, point is, we have a simple example, goes back about one month when this was granted, but it actually points to exactly the matters that are being talked about and that people are actually telling us about. Namely, Highlands is in a good position. We just need to work our way there. We have to, again, utilize the history that we have relative to what this school has done for minority. But I do appreciate the statements that I heard in the strategic plan. I think in our particular case, the idea of identifying one particular group and not looking at total diversity of our institution, including diversity by gender, uh, diversity by race, diversity by, you know, style of living, you know, that kind of situation. I think if we move in a direction aggressively, I have to, we, we have to recognize all of that. But we have to be, like I said before, and like the strategic plan seems to be pointing, we have to make sure that the situation regarding where we want to go to the institution is done wisely. We need to take advantage of these designations, though. We cannot ignore them. We need to take advantage of that because those of us that have worked in terms of trying to draw research to our institution, recognize the fact that a lot of times the ability to actually draw on funding is dependent on ge geogra ge 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 geographics and also demographics. And we need to take advantage of both. I apologize, uh, Dr. Martinez, for taking so much time. But again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that the, the, the most important comment that maybe I could say here is that we as an institution uh, need to want this, embrace this, and work towards it. Um, you know, there can be some of us that are willing to, and then some of us that aren't, and that then just creates uh, a, a tension within. And I think that we need to really look within and uh, make a commitment towards it. And I think that our strategic plan is a step towards that. And, and, and again, I, I wanted to comment about the programs that uh, Dr. Salazar mentioned is that is another measure is how uh, what types of academic programs do institutions have that address these types of, uh, of uh, diversity, whether it's uh, African American studies or uh, Chicano literature or Chicano studies or, you know, those things, but many institutions are going beyond that. And I, and, and I would hope that we could move that way as well is Many institutions are going beyond these types of programs and they're now working towards integrating this type of content into the curriculum across all disciplines. And, and that, that's gonna take a lot of work, I, I admit that. But that's when we begin to really embrace what we, um, to embrace a diversity, uh, inclusion, and, and, and equity. Because again, if we have a African-American studies, uh, you know, as a STEM major, I probably would have never taken an American studies course, right? 
And so that's why it's important to me to, to think about how could my professors have integrated some of this into the STEM courses that I was taking, right? And so um, um, I, I think that uh, we need to embrace it and work towards it, but we need to figure out what it is uh, first. Anything else, I, uh, Adam, are we out of time here? Uh, yes, unfortunately, Dr. Martinez, uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, we hit the needle. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I'd like to thank everyone for, for the great discussion and uh, for taking time to listen to me. Uh, I'm available for more conversation and would be happy to work on these initiatives uh, in the position that I'm in. Thank you.